Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next podcast, episode 164, with uh, myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. I love the um, that, uh, that title, especially... I like the I like the title "Wonderful Bob Cook," but I also like the countdown to two hundred, where or what we're having, ever we're heading for, and how many um, episodes we do. So this one is about um, how how we well, say that phrase again, because I know I put the title over, but I forget what turning is. down the negative messages in our head. Right, very very. Here's an example. Uh, let's let's think. So my and I've often been my daughter this so so that this must be transfers. But anyway, I'm going to use this example. So she she lives quite. How can I explain this? Okay, she works quite a long way away from her home. If she goes by tram or she goes by car, it takes sorry tram and bus it takes an hour and a half. So yeah. quite often, I mean, I'm partly retired, so I. I have, and I get up very early. I walk the dogs at six o'clock in the morning. So quite often I will take her for half an hour. Yeah. Uh, so it only takes me half an hour in the car and then half an hour back. And it's in rush hour, so I might go 40 hours there, 40 hours back. But there was one time where she forgot something and we got nearly all there. And then we had to go back again to get what she forgot and then back again and back again. Now I didn't mind from my perspective uh, okay, it was over two hours, two and a half hours in the car. But having said all that, I like talking to her, catching oh, her, all those different things, connecting with her. But she, con- she expressed a terrible narrative about how she hated her brain because she's neurodiverse, how she forgets things, and I had to stop her because I didn't want. I wanted her to be kind on herself. I said, "Yes, you know." I'd like you to be kind to yourself because actually I enjoy being with you. I know you might, you know, you've suffered, you know, you've got ADHD and you're on medication and things like that. And there's times when you may forget things. And I can't remember exactly what I said, but I did promote the idea of a kind narrative. Yeah. Right. If we now go back to what podcast title is, now I've said that example. Part of the duty of a therapist tonight, hopefully, I wasn't, she didn't experience me as being a therapist, but, you know, she often in her life um, has been brought up by, well, she's been brought up by me and Steph, obviously, but will say, oh, yeah, I'm brought up by two psychotherapists. So yeah. I hope she didn't hear that <laughs> remark then. But the duty, I think, of a psychotherapist, if you're promoting self-esteem for the client, a value for the client, so if they see themselves as valuable and worthwhile. Yeah. You have to help them diminish their negative criticalness, if you like, of their self and help them, if possible, to come from a kinder narrative. Yeah, it's, it's quite, well, I, I wanted to say it's quite difficult, but it's really difficult for a lot of people to do that, to be compassionate and to show compassion and self-love and all those things. It's so much easier to be critical. <laughs> Well, let's dissect that. Right. A, I agree with you, unfortunately. Yeah. I really do want to say unfortunately. B, many, many clients, many, many, many clients will come with exactly what you just talked about there. And C, um, the question for us as therapists, I think, counsellors listen to the podcast, is how come they yeah. ultimately move to that negative narrative? So yeah. I'll put that over to you. For me, I think it's a protective mechanism again. It's so much easier to look at the negative side of things. We, it's in our DNA. It's, it's part of who we are as human beings to to look at the, the negative stuff as a protection mechanism. That's an interesting one. So you, look, I'm not disagreeing, okay? I'm just interested in the way you put that out because, well, I suppose I do disagree. I think we're negatively biased <laughs> as human I beings. Do 
I suppose I do disagree, Jack. But what I mean is, I understand that sentence construction. I suppose what I mean is that if you look at the nature nurture debate, yeah, I'm much more on the side of nurture, and I believe that most psychological processes uh, come from the developmental stages that we go through and our relationship with significant others and the decisions we make ourselves. I don't think, this is where I said I disagree, but I understand where you're coming from, that it, that somehow genetically we are born telling ourselves off. No, but I think it's easier for us, uh, uh, that negative bias, for us to look at the negative side of the what if rather than the positive side of the what ifs. <laughs> well, here we are. I think the types of clients we see, an example I gave Jess, of course, you brought up with us. So that's a, not, not a wonderful advert here. But anyway, um, has a lot to do with the modelling of the significant parents. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's the parent models. And of course, you've got mixed parenting, remember, you know, um, people have different ways of parenting that can be quite mixed. Yeah. They have universally have parenting that will have a model of the life being uh, full, not half empty. Yeah. They're more likely, I think, to have a positively kind of narrative than the opposite type of modeling, which yeah. is, oh, everything's the da 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 da. So the person ends up seeing the world half empty. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I I do agree with what you're saying. I think there is a, a big nature nurture debate in this, and I had two completely different parents. I'm sure I've mentioned this before. Yeah, you know, I didn't, but that's what I just I didn't say. Uh, because definitely, that split for me that that one was really you know is really negative, and the other was quite optimistic about things. <laughs> so there's a internal conflict, internal conflict with me a lot of the time. I mean, I I think I'm quite hard on myself around parenting around Jessica, for example, because she will go very quickly into this process of negative narratives. And I, I'm at a puzzle where that's come from. And I, on this podcast, I don't have to clearly debate that. But when you say it's in a person's DNA, I know it's because of what I'm here hearing, I can go that way. But I still think that a person's childhood, their developmental stages, their decisions in response to what's happened to them in their life has a lot to do with the speed they may move to to negatively criticise themselves. Yeah. I think as well with the negative side of things is we focus more on it. It's easier to build up a negative story. If it's a positive thought, it tends to just come and go and we don't give it much attention. Whereas if it's a negative thought, it's like, oh, I need to pay attention to that. <laughs> so it's it's what we do with the thought, I think, that yeah. is as much... Yeah, I, I would agree with that one. And I, I think maybe I'm guilty of promoting with, with, with my daughter uh, perfectionism. Yeah, because even with you, Bob, how you receive something, if somebody says something positive, often we don't really pay much attention to it. You know, if somebody says, oh, Bob, you're looking really well today, we kind of go, oh, thank you. You know, if somebody comes up and says, God, Bob, you're looking a bit rough. Are you OK? Is there anything wrong with you? One, it can often impact how we're feeling physically. We'll take it on board, but it'll play on our minds a lot more than the you're looking really nice. Well, I know you're a chair therapist, so what I'm going to say now is just to bring into the whole um, subject here about the concepts of strokes. Yes. Transaction analysis. Yeah. And stroke, a definition of a stroke, it can be a positive or negative, sorry, a unit of social recognition, whether it's positive or negative. That's what Eric Burns' definition of a stroke is. So if I'm teaching the 101, for example, I'll teach a lot about positive recognition in terms of strokes or negative recognition, 
That's yeah. A stroke is a stroke, yeah. <laughs> now, where you are, what I'm going to say now is going to back up, if you'll like this, completely what you have just said. Good. So what happens with most people is if you give them exercises about receiving and taking strokes, positive or negative, they will have, they will usually struggle in receiving positive strokes. Much more than receiving negative strokes. Yeah. So is that always down to their upbringing and the decisions made, or is there underlying some of that a genetic thing in us as human beings for protection that we need to notice the bad stuff? Well, I'm still not convinced. Okay. <laughs> I'll accept the first. Okay. Oh, that, that's I'm halfway there then, Bob. Yeah, You're halfway there. I think it's very, 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 very important. The problem is parents are only human. Yeah, see, the other thing that I need to say, Bob, and just throw it into the mix is it's it's got more to do with our decisions about the way that we're brought up, I yeah. think. If yeah, you've got, to, like, there's me and my sister, and we've turned out completely different. The way we look at the world is completely different, but we were brought up by the, you know, my mother is her mother, my father is her father. We were brought up the same. Potentially. Well, I, I think what I've just said is really important that we're all human. And I think another piece of theory I like in TA is generational scripts. Yes, yeah. So I think scripts get passed down as life plans of yeah. people um, from generation to generation. And we almost follow them either from accepting those commands or non verbal messages or or modeling uh, non-verbally, so the script gets carried down. So if there's a script around being stoic, not showing feelings, that can get modeled and passed down. So the next generation has the same process going on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that's, that, in terms of a conversation here, I think that's really important. I don't think that's to do with the DNA. I prefer the, you know, the idea of generational scripts more. Yeah, or we can do the complete opposite. Could you say a little bit more about Again, that? it's about the decisions that we make. You know, if you we don't we like cannot... the way that we're parented, yeah. we make the decision, I'm not going to be like them, I'm going to do this instead. Uh, well, that could be over-adaption. It still, does, it still doesn't, it can still mean that you're following the script. But you do it from an overadaptive rebellious place or compliant overadaptive compliance uh, place, not necessarily adult, but you still follow the script, but you do it in a reverse way. See, that's just blow my mind, Bob. <laughs> yeah. So for example, somebody says, you know, um whatever. Yeah. And so the child decides to rebel and do the opposite. Yeah. They do the opposite from such an adapted place. They so so say the message comes down oh something like all Scots people are mean and that's you know so it's modelled by the father that never has any Scots friends or whatever it is so what happens is say the child decides well I don't really like that I've got a Scottish people person at school I'm going and what happens is the the whole or might happen is the whole peer network then is full of Scottish people they go to the exact extreme because of the over adaptation and they're still following the script or a version of the script but it's in reverse in other words I've never the... never ever ever thought about it that way bob oh well then <laughs> i've learned something that, not that I've lo don't learn something from you in every podcast but that's just blown my mind yeah i did it that's why i, did, I, I do it on a daily basis <laughs> yeah so you see, compliance and rebellion at its extreme, yeah, are over adaptation to the script. Yeah, because am I right in thinking that one? You know me in my diagrams. That one of the diagrams in the the child is that it's split in half, but then quarters with adaptive and rebellious child on one side, yeah, and yeah. the free child on the other. One, one of the diagrams. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so my childhood was so full of. Um, difficulties um, everything I said was no 
but it was from an automatic place without adult thinking. Yeah. It was from the child automatically. No. It wasn't with any adult, no resource to an adult thinking. Well, is this good for me? Isn't that good for me? Do I agree with that? Do I agree with that? But all any of these thought processes, it would just know. And that's an over adaptation, isn't it? To the generational script. It is when you put it that way, Bob, yeah. So what do we do about going back to the topic? I feel like we've gone off topic. <laughs> well, well, turning down the negative messages in our this head. This is Bob. your job. Thank you very much. I can get carried away. Me so too. I, this is what I think. And I said it in another podcast when we were talking about critical parents. I think the first step, and I said it very, and you did as well, we both said the same thing, is for the client or the person we're working with to become aware that yeah. that internal negative message doesn't come and isn't a decision from themselves. It's come from somewhere else as a decision in response to something else gets yeah. played out in the present but it's not theirs so they may feel like it's not there. It's them yeah i really hate my brain or whatever it is now where does that come from it, you know it's not it's not from themselves it's from what somebody else has said a version of something to them yeah and once the person really understands that the way they tell themselves off isn't from themselves it's a version of the a similar verbal or non-verbal discourse and once they make that leap they can then start working to with the therapist towards being in charge of their own destiny and changing their internal thinking but they have to make that leap and that's a yeah. You know, gradual therapeutic process. But some of this is is like habitual stuff as well, isn't it? We're so it's so quick to go down that road that it becomes habitual thinking a lot of the time. So the awareness of it and questioning it to me is is a big step. You know, bringing it to therapy is a big deal for a lot of people because then we're kind of shining a torch on it, saying, "Oh, look at this." You're completely right, and. Um, in many ways, uh, well, you're perfectly right. The this way of behaving becomes a habit. Yeah. You're then into how does the therapist therapist help the person? Um, yeah, become aware of this habitual behavioural program or this habitual process. And I think the first step is is happened already. And I'm sorry, that's in other words the motivation of the client to be there the second step is for the therapist over and over and over and over again to help them be aware of the process yeah now it will take a lot of habits by the therapist <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> this is the this is the sort of parallel process um to actually almost by definition habitually if you like from adult though not from child position to help the person be aware of that process even if the client is dismissing that process yeah yes yeah yeah so Absolutely. perseverance from the therapist to help the client be aware of that process even if the client continually discounts denies minimalizing process somewhere yeah and for me a couple of things one you mentioned it earlier on with the conversation that you had with your daughter in the car about you know showing the client how to be compassionate with themselves do you know that's, what i mean and that's to the word compassion in a, a nice way rather than a critical way which it goes against the grain with a lot of people you know but we can model that in the therapy room we're allowed yeah. to make mistakes. We're allowed to get it wrong. It doesn't mean that we're a bad person. All this sort of stuff can be really helpful on the road. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. Now, in recent times, and I don't know when it was actually when EFT EFT as a therapist, sorry, as a therapy was designed or originally created, but um, if we're talking about compassionate therapy, there's a huge movement. 
therapeutic movement um, about, you know, helping the client. EFT as in emotional freedom technique, yeah. or whatever they call it. Yeah, yeah. Being compassionate with themselves. Now, Ruby Wax, you heard of her? Yeah, she's yeah. A comedian who's very popular, or was very, very popular, but I think she's getting on a bit now. She trained to become a therapist and writes quite a lot about compassionate therapy and also I'm sure if you put Ruby Wax Compassionate Therapy into YouTube there's probably a lot on it. Yeah. So this place that you're talking about, which is, you know, compassionate therapy is the antidote to this negative process we've just talked about. I agree, I agree, I agree. However, the next bit, the most important bit, the most important bit in all this I'm listening, I'm listening. I've got my pen, I'm writing it down. How you help the therapist get to that place. Now, if you've got a client that's been brutalised, has been humiliated, that's been shamed, that's been abused, how do you get to a place to even um, work with the client to even believe in compassion as a concept, let alone a reality. Now, I, I'm not saying we have the answer to these questions, but if they've never had any modeling from the parent at all, or even seen any compassion, how can they then believe in their own compassion? Mm. These are questions. They're not, mm. they're not, they're not, I haven't got the answer it's to solved in a podcast. <laughs> no, I believe in you, you what you said. I, in my 101s, the transaction analysis 101s, I talk about the concept of stroke sandwiches. Yeah. You know what that is, don't you? Yeah, a positive, a negative, and a positive. That yeah, because yeah. the selling just give people um, compassionate transactions or, yeah. or even to promote them to go home and say compassionate things about themselves is far too much for them. Yes, yeah. And they'll probably be psychologically sick and you'll never see them again. <laughs> or say that, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. or it'll become counterproductive. Yeah. So we have to think very carefully about how we get to a place where they can start to develop uh the capacity for compassion if they've never actually received it. Now, I, I I mean I've talked to many therapists about this and they say Oh, well, what I do, I find, you know, one of the things I look at is I'll ask them, like, did they have a grandmother? Did they have a grandfather? Was there anyone who was kind to them? And all these things. I think that's a great road to go down in terms of uh, inquiry and being attuned to their histories. What do we do when the person says, no? No. I don't remember in my history anyone, teacher, friends, mothers, fathers, grandfathers, showing any compassion to me now that's an interesting one for a therapist yeah i agree with you modeling therapist modeling but it has to be done very gradually very gently um and you have to work with the trauma that the client is bringing um and i just think by being in the room by being attuned to them, by listening to them, by showing your heart is a very good first step. See, Bob, you're you're touching me psychologically on everything that you're saying here. And the one thing that you know constantly keeps coming, well, there's two things that keep coming up for me. One is how being negative is really bad for your health physically. <laughs> And that's something I've been working on since my diagnosis an awful lot is how negatively I talk to myself and that that isn't the best for me physically. I don't make good choices when I'm not in a good place mentally. So it's it's really important for us that we learn to be compassionate and kind and take good care of ourselves mentally and physically. I agree with you. As a, I've started to walk the dogs because my wife's not very well. She's pulled a ligament. Oh, bless her. They take ages to repair. Yeah. I walk the dogs at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I often drag myself out of bed, even though I'm a morning person. 
And I was walking around, I live near the River Mercy. So I was walking around the usual mile and a half that I do. And I was starting to be critical to myself. I'm, I almost say like intrusive thoughts in a way about certain things. And as I started to change or attempt to change my pattern of thinking, I thought, oh, aren't the trees nice today? Isn't that sun coming through the, and looking at, and I, I suddenly realized what was happening, that I was almost like grounding myself yeah. with the beauty of the war work sorry the walk the walking around something it, it's very grounding you know um i think we should give I our love that. yeah clients, i'm thinking of introducing gift. walking talking therapy to my repertoire of things that i do bob for that exactly i'm going down that road with you not only as <laughs> to the gym but also to think about um what you just said really and put that into the menu of our therapeutic discourse yeah. I use humour as well a lot with my clients. If they're being really yeah. negative, I will go full on, not beating them up, but I will use humour as a way of doing it, like using affirmations and standing in front of a mirror and tell yourself, I am worthy, I am loved, I am special. And the, you can see them cringing, which is why I said when you were, said something about being emotionally sick or something, I do that with my clients a lot of the time, just to give them a bit of a wake-up call. Because yeah. it's so easy for us to look in the mirror and be so critical of the way that we look, you know, the way that we dress, yeah. everything about us. Yeah. No, ab absolutely. And where that comes from, though, I'm going back to the beginning of this podcast, is really important for them to understand that it's not yeah. their discourse. Yeah. Is a version of a non-verbal verbal process from somewhere else. Yeah. Though the thing is, it feels for people, feels for people that it is their own. Absolutely, discipline. absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the therapist's job, as I said earlier on, however you get there, is to help them realise that, that this discourse is someone else's. Yeah, and I suppose it's another example of where we as therapists and counsellors need to be more potent than that internal voice and get them to, yeah. the awareness is key to all of this for me, is to notice the thought, because often we just notice the feeling and not the thought. <laughs> we just notice that we feel crap. But the reality is we've just barraged ourselves yeah. with a lot of negative thinking. Yeah, so you might need to step into the transference and take on the originator of that discourse mm. and tell that person, to butt out of the room. I love that. So that's what I mean when I say I challenge things and just throw a spanner in the works. <laughs> yeah. And one of your phrases, which I like, and I, I remember, uh, and if I were working clinically, I'd probably use, is take to court. Yeah. I tell my clients to do that all the time. <laughs> but you have to be, you have to, I think this is where the therapist in this type of process needs to take on the originator of the negative discourse. Yeah. Because then what happens is that not only does a client feel protected, and somebody is actually saying what they wish they could have said for such a long time, but was so scared for the very valid reasons. Um, that's number one. And secondly, they start to make the connections. Well, it's not me really saying that. This is where it comes from. Yeah. They have the. I think they need the psychological protection. Absolutely. To start making that awareness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. For me as well. I, I, you know, we're going off tangents again here, and maybe it's a good topic for another podcast. Is when the the client's done this work and and realised that actually, you know, this is not my stuff that's going on in my head. There's a period of why have I wasted so much time listening to this negative voice. Well, they can go down that mode. They might go down that mode. For me, I've after this, I kind of worked on forgiveness with my client, as in not right. only maybe forgiving the person that is the voice in the head, but also forgiving themselves for listening to it for so long. It's mm. it's a weird one, but yeah, self forgiveness I think is important as much as anything. Oh, compassion and self forgiveness. I mean, what a wonderful title of a new podcast. 
No. <laughs> I do, I believe it. I don't know if we've done it. I don't think we had. I know I've given you 14 more new topics, but that's a good title. Well, I'm putting that one down in my book, Bob. Self-forgiveness or something around that. And I think what you said about habits, it's very important to think about that 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 term process of going so quickly to our default system. Yeah. It's a really hard one for the client to be aware of. And I think that's why the therapist needs to take that mantle. Yeah. The 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 yeah, our thoughts are so sneaky, we don't even notice them. You know, if I say to a client, if they're coming in and they're feeling a bit crappy, and I'll say to them, So what 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 have you been thinking? What's the thoughts that's been going through your head? And they'll go, nothing. Well, they are. So your job is to help them do something else rather than reinforce their script. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed this one, Bob. Great. I Thank you so much. There. So what we're going to be doing next time, and I love this, but I've no idea what topics will come up, <laughs> is the powers in the patient, an important reminder. Oh, this this is one of my favourite podcasts of all time, so I'm glad I'm going to be talking about it. I'm thinking I'm going to like that one as well, I'm Bob. Glad I love that title. I'm glad we're going to be talking about it. Yeah. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Speak soon. Speak soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.